Let's take a look at uh, the book of Judges as we're continuing on our Wednesday morning uh, men's study. And uh, we're looking at the book of Judges. As you can see, we started with chapter two. We're just skipping through again, since this is based upon the 365 key chapters of the Bible, uh, we naturally need to select. And in the book, book of Judges, we've selected Judges two and then six, and then uh, just a few more chapters to give an overview. So in order to fill in some of the details, then I'd like to kind of give you some more backdrop and uh, a background to the book of Judges itself. So in doing so, then uh, let's just take a look at um, the uh, theme and purpose of the book of Judges, because it's important for us to have a, a good feel for really uh, what this book does in contrast to the book of Joshua. And you'll see tremendously uh, uh, different uh, motifs that are here. Uh, what it's seeking to do, of course, is to carry the storyline of Israel from the death of Joshua to the time of Samuel and then to the beginning of the United Kingdom. And so it was written uh, during the reign of Saul, who reigned from uh, 1043 to 1011 BC, or during the uh, first seven years of, um, of David's reign, uh, who reigned... Uh, in that in that in that period of time, those first four years, the first seven years, ten eleven to ten oh uh, four, and it gives an explanation uh, and um, a defense of Israel's monarchy and the whole concept of the nation needing to being, be needing to be united under a righteous king, and so it really provides that point of view or that perspective. So, in given given that idea, then um, we go to the theme itself which is highly uh, selective, and it's uh, Im important for us to see that um, it, is, it is indeed a selective book. It's, it's highly uh, thematic. And as we see it here, uh, chapters 17 to 21 really preceded most of chapters uh, th 3 to 16. So again, what we're looking at here is uh, these chapters are used to illustrate the moral conditions uh, that were prevailing during the entire period of the Judges. And so Judges gives an, a geographical survey of apostasy. So it's a kind of a, a picture of how it spreads geographically from all the realms of the kingdom itself and uh, the spread of apostasy in such a way that uh, it, in, it has a, a climax in chapters 17 to 21 which actually uh, then has a, the last verse as a fitting uh, conclusion. That in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So that becomes emblematic and thematic for the entire book of Judges then as we move from there. So what is the purpose of the book of Judges? Well, theologically, we could say that the ju Judges makes a very clear contrast uh, between the idolatry and the immor immorality and the violence of Israel and Yahweh's covenant faithfulness and his gracious deliverance of his people it couldn't be greater. Uh, so God's patient love is such that he forgave the repentant every time, every single time they repented. And at the same time, Israel rebelled in foolishness, in, in gratitude, in stubbornness, and rebellion. And this would consistently lead to defeat, and sin always leads to suffering, and repentance always leads to deliverance. And that should be a pretty obvious lesson for our lives, and it's the same today as it was then. The circumstances change, civilizations change, and yet the human condition, the human heart, does not. At the end of the day, it turns out that there is this, always this fundamental motif of whether we're going to go our way or God's way. And there's always this pull. And even when a, a person becomes a follower of Jesus, there's still this constant pull between what I want it to be like and what we discover life is going to be given to us by the living God and whether we're going to submit to his purposes in our lives or not. So this becomes a, a major motif in this book as well. Some of the keys uh, to the book of Judges include the, this key word cycles, and it's a very critical uh, term because uh, then the anger of the Lord was uh, hot against Israel, and he said, because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and has not heeded my voice, he goes on to say, I also will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. 
And so there's this whole cyclical process, as we'll see again, um, this, this fitting summary of the book of Judges. Uh, again, no king, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so this idea of a cyclical process, as we can see, becomes a, a serious uh, issue. And, uh, judge, and, and chapter two really becomes a miniature of the entire book because it records the transition of the godly to the ungodly generation. And it, it, it also provides the format of the cycles as well as the purpose of God in not actually destroying the Canaanites. And one of the things that we, that we see concerning these cycles in the book of Judges, and I'm going to jump ahead to that in just a moment here, is what we can see is this whole theme uh, we've observed before in our first time when we saw this process that sin, which was always some variation of idolatry, would always lead inevitably to servitude. And for a period of time, often many years, they would then serve um, because of that, uh, the God would raise up, raise up another nation because of the rebellion against him. And they'd have to serve that king or that nation for a period of time until finally they would make their supplication to God. And once having made their cry uh, to, of, uh, and plea for mercy to God, then he would quickly provide salvation in the form of a judge. And then as a result of that, there would be a peace, a, a time of rest or peace or silence in the land until the next cycle would repeat. So you have sin, servitude, supplication, salvation, and silence repeating itself. And there's seven cycles of this. Uh, if you, another way of using it is or with ours, you could have rebellion followed by retribution of God and then repentance uh, by the people. And then after the repentance, he would provide restoration. And after the restoration, there'd be a period of rest in which case the process would then continue again. So there was this ongoing process. So going, re returning back to this idea, the interesting thing is that they often served for multiple years. And it's a fascinating thing how after their sin, they would serve and hang here and almost like just hover here again and again in this process until they'd finally cry out to God when it became so bad. It was like, has it come to this that we have to pray? Um, that uh, supplication, then God would quickly provide salvation and silence, but then they'd hang over here again. So it seems that they spent more time in servitude than they did in silence. Or we could say more time um, in this, uh, act, this context of God's d d dealing with their sin than they did in rest. And so as a result of this, it just continued to go around and around. And it became... Um, an oppressive force. And it really was a spiral downwards as well, because it was not just a matter of going at recurring cycles, but it actually there was a continual diminishment as a result. They, they were really going downward. And there was this process then that we see then aptly concluding the book with those chapters at the end, 17 to 21, that actually illustrate that very well. So this just gives us a feel or an illustration for what that looks like there. And so this becomes uh, a format of the book itself. So we, we see then that there is a, a purpose for not uh, actually removing uh, the, Je the, the Canaanites. And we discover that uh, there's, uh, there's reason for the fact that God does not do this because um, their disobedience and not destroying them, um, the enslavement of the Can Canaanites instead of the total destruction, uh, certain things they were told not to do. And so God then actually has a purpose then in doing so, to punish them for their disobedience, to test and prove that uh, the Israelites as to whether they would obey God or not, and to drive out the Canaanites and separate them uh, and their gods, and to, to instruct the new generation in warfare for future defense needs. So there's a lot of uh, components that are going on at the same time with this material. Um, we continue then its contribution to the Bible and uh, Judges really does record um, the failure of the theocracy due to the lack of faith and obedience. And so the problem wasn't the rule of God, the problem was the disobedience of man. And as a consequence of that then, they did not want to obey God and ultimately they would cry out for a visible king instead and ultimately would go after the time of Judges to a time of the monarchy. So thus, in this very real way, then, they were disloyal to their, uh, to their uh, divine king. And as a consequence, uh, they wanted to have some kind of an earthly king. And so we have this interesting contrast here between the book of Joshua 
and the book of Judges. Because Joshua describes Israel experiencing the freedom of entering uh, uh, into the promised land, while Judges records its subsequent uh, bondage in the promised land. So we go from a, pro a geographical progress uh, in the book of Joshua to a decline geographically in Judges. In Joshua, we see Israel's conquest of the promised land through their belief in God. But then Judges records their defeat because of their disbelief in God. It always comes down, really, to their relationship with the living God as to uh, the disposition and the well-being of the people. It depended then on their response, whether they're going to trust God or not. That's the whole nation, nature of a theocratic covenant nation that they are ultimately then, and they made their commitment as well under Joshua and before that with Moses, that this is the law and we will do it. And yet they could not keep the law. And so we consider, consider another contrast. Far be it for, that we should for, forsake the Lord and serve other gods, they said in Joshua 24, 16. Yet it says in, in Judges 3, 7, So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. So again, this serious uh, contrast that takes place. So that Israel served God in Joshua, but served themselves in Judges. Um, Israel knew the person of God and the power of God in Joshua, but in Judges they knew neither his person nor his power, and 2.10 becomes a critical verse for that understanding. Uh, we go from an objective morality to a subjective morality. That is to say that they are now doing what is right in their own eyes rather than what is right in the sight of the living God. And that comes down to where we are right now. So at the end of the day, we can, we're in the same situation in a very, a very real parallel way. Either, for example, the, the world will judge the word of God or the word of God will judge the world. But you, one will win out in the end. And so we're trying to play by two sets of rules when we try to play by uh, the world's rules in one sense. And then in another capacity, then we kind of have a bifurcated life where we separate one part of our life from another. And so we're inconsistent. We're trying to serve two masters and we have to choose who will then we, we serve this day. Uh, we see this well, Israel pressing onward, but then as I saw as we saw, they spiral downward. And so sin is judged in the book of Joshua, but it becomes tolerated in the book of Judges. So there's a very real decline. So we have faith and obedience, which is demonstrated in Joshua, but a lack of both in, in the book of, of Judges. So these two different books, though they chronologically follow each other, show Israel in two completely different lights. And they show how quickly we can go astray from the living God. So this becomes really a motif, a, a whole astonishing picture, really, a portrait of the condition of the human heart, um, especially when we see a collective narrative and we see as well in our own lives whether we're going to pursue the people of God and the purposes of God or whether we're going to become autonomous agents of ourselves and try to have the world in our, according to our terms, as, as re rather than what the living God who's created us and redeemed us has purchased us twice, and yet at the same time, um, who, the one who owns us by way of creation and also by way of redemption, still we rebel against him. It's a constant process that we see. We see that uh, Christ is uh, in the book of Judges, um, and each judge was regarded as a savior or as a ruler. And so there was a spiritual and political component uh, to this. And as well, um, the book really reveals the need for a righteous king at the end. Furthermore, in this, um, a savior king and a righteous king. And is, in the book of Judges, there were 17 judges are mentioned altogether. And some of those were warrior rulers like Othniel and Gideon. One was a priest, Eli. One was a prophet, Samuel, the first of the school of the prophets. And this then gives a cumulative picture, really, in a very interesting way, of the three offices of Christ, who ex excelled all of his predecessors. He was the ultimate prophet. He was the ultimate priest and king, but not according to the order of Levi, but rather the order of 
Melchizedek, as we see later on. So this just gives us some perspectives that I think can be very useful and helpful for us as we uh, assess this book. So going back to this whole process here of this cycle of the judges, let's go back to chapter two in the book of Judges, and we can see how the angel of the Lord came up and, re and there was a rebuke because of the failure to keep the covenant uh, with God, and already they were beginning to disobey God. And so as a result of them, he said, I'm not going to drive them out. They wept. Joshua then dies, and it tells us the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work with the Lord, uh, which he had done for Israel. But then it tells us in verse 10, all that generation were also gathered to their fathers, and then there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. So then we see the paradigm, the pattern that we can see consistently. This is the pattern where they would do evil in the sight of the Lord. They'd serve various gods and they would forsake God. And as a result of that, in their following them, they'd bow down because you're going to serve somebody. So they provoke the Lord to anger. They forsook God, served false deities. God then uh, gave them into the hands of plunderers who plundered them. So we have, again, uh, this, this next, the next cycle here. So the, the, ser the servitude component there. And then it tells us as well that um, they could no longer stand and whatever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. And then finally, it would tell us then that the, would, he would raise them from uh, up judges to deliver them. But they didn't listen to their judges. They played the harlot and they did the whole thing again. So they, they re repeat the process. So God raises up judges. The Lord was with the judge, delivered them all the days. But the Lord, because the Lord was moved uh, to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, what would happen? They'd turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers, following other gods. So this is the process that you see again and again. This cycle is recurring and repeating. So we can see then um, this uh, whole idea of idolatry then leading uh, to servitude in chapter 3 as well. So it tells us about the fact that these nations and various nations of the Philistines and so forth, and we can see the various uh, nations. And then we go to the first judge, and when it tells us, when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. So it tells us then, because of the fact that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, this is the sin, they forgot the Lord their God, then the anger of the Lord was kindled, and he sold them into the hands. So that's uh, we go back we're again from sin to servitude. And so the process recurring, we can see it yet again. And then it tells us that they would serve him. In this case, eight years. They took eight years before they finally cried out to the Lord. They could have done so immediately. Instead, they, they, they just wallow in disbelief and in rebellion. And finally, they cry to the Lord, and he raises up a deliverer for them. In this case, it was Othniel. And the Spirit of the Lord came. He judged them. And he went out to war, and the Lord gave the king of Mesopotamia, who was that particular oppressor, into his hands. And the hand, land had, had rest for 40 years, and then he died. And then they did again evil in the sight of the Lord. So he strengthened Eglon, king of Moab. So you can see it. This recurring process goes on and on and on. Another way of looking at this, then, is to, is to see the, this whole process of looking at the enemies dwelling in Canaan during the times of the judges, because you had all kinds of components here because the judges were not national rulers, but local rulers. So some would deliver them uh, further from the south. Some de dealt with uh, uh, enemies in the north. But in, in any case, you have this whole process here. This is an ongoing cycle that's going on. And the cycles of the book of Judges, again, uh, the, 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 there was the, the sin and then, then the sin is followed by the servitude, supplication, salvation, and silence. So the first cycle was Mesopotamia under Othniel. Then the second cycle, chapter 3, uh, 12, e Ehud, and again an 80-year period of silence in that particular era, portion of Israel. Third cycle, the Canaanites were the enemy. And then Deborah and Barak are raised up. And then there's a, pe a, a period of rest for 40 years. The fourth cycle... It's the Midianites, and the story of Gideon then relates to that period of time. And once again, uh, the salvation through Gideon is, is provided, 
and then there's a period of rest for 40 years until they, they rec it, it recurs. The fifth cycle uh, under Tola and Jer, and then the sixth cycle would be under the uh, Ammonites and Jephthah, and that was a 31-year process there. And then the seventh cycle would be the Philistines with Samson. So you can see this recurring pattern, this recurring motif that continues to uh, be like a plague upon the people of themselves that just becomes a recurring process. And so this becomes uh, a very real uh, realm of, of disobedience for the people. So God delivers then uh, the people and Ehud uh, delivers them from the Moabites and so, uh, so forth. And uh, it gives us details about how this occurs and kind of a gruesome story here. Um, and uh, then uh, he goes out, is, uh, so then he, he, he does it by um, pretending to want to have a private message with the king, but then he actually kills the king. And um, he leaves them on the floor uh, dead. In fact, it's, in, it's interesting because in the, uh, the cool upper room is where he went, to, uh, that's where they would go to relieve themselves. And um, so they thought that he was just doing that. And so that gave Ehud a chance to escape after he plunged the sword into him. And so while they were delaying, he passed by the idols and escaped. Um, and then he, he, then he blew the trumpet. And then there was a deliverance and they pursued them and uh, pre uh, overcame. Um, a very brief mention of a, of a judge, not well known, named Shamgar, and then uh, Deborah and Barak, who delivered the people of Israel from the Canaanites. And so again, it tells us about how again there was a deliverance, and the, uh, the again the process, the repetitive process in, in each of these cycles after Othniel and the and the, um, the judge, and then after the second with Ehud. Then you also have this uh, next cycle with. Um, this, this process here with uh, Deborah and Barak. And so you have uh, Deborah, who is a prophetess. And it's intriguing that um, she is, uh, re receives the word of the Lord. And then the sons of Israel come to her for judgment. So she had a clear authority. Um, and then Barak is summoned. And behold, the Lord God of Israel is commanded, go and march to Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and from the sons of Zebulun, and I'll draw you uh, to, out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army. So this is in the northern area with his armies, and I'll give them into your hand. So Barak said, though Barak, um, who was supposed to be the one who would do this, he uh, needed her with him. He had a, a doubt. He did not have the courage um, and to trust in the Lord alone, so he wanted her to be with him. She said, I will surely go with you. But then she said, nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey that you're about to take. The Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. So then Deborah rose and went to Bar with Barak to Kadesh. And then he calls Deb Zebulun and Naphtali together to, to, to Kadesh, and then um, Kadesh, and then 10,000 men went with him. And then it tells us about the story about uh, Sisera um, and, the, and then how he called together his uh, chariots, 900 iron chariots and all the people who were with him. And this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your, into your hands. So Deborah says to Barak, this is the day. He goes down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. But then Sisera, it tells us, alighted from his chariot and fled away. And just as, as Deborah predicted, it would not be Barak who would have that full victory, but actually it would be a, uh, someone else. It would be a woman in jail, her name, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. So uh, Jael went out to meet Sisera, and she actually brought him in. And uh, gives them, um, takes them in and gives them something to drink. But then she actually uh, kills him with, by taking a tent peg and seizing a hammer and went secretly to him when he was asleep and he was exhausted and he died. So Barak pursued Sisera and then Jael came out to meet him and said, come, I will show you the man whom you're seeking. So just as Deborah had predicted, so it was the case. He entered with her and Sisera was lying dead. So God subdued on that day Jabin the king of Canaan before the sons of Israel. 
The hands of the sons of Israel pressed heavier and heavier upon Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed him. So this gives us uh, a certain perspective about what's going on during that period of time, that you have then certain disobediences, certain components. God raises up various people, various local judges. And so there's a complex period of time here in which there is in, indeed a kind of a movement of further and further away from God, especially as a new generation is raised who really don't have a faith in the living God. And as a consequence, it becomes increasingly evident in the weakness of the people themselves. Chapter five is a kind of a, uh, a song of uh, Deborah and Barak. And so what you have here is much more of a, um, of a kind of a portrait um, in that process here of uh, a tale of the story here and their deliverances and a, a poetic aspirations of what exactly took, took place during this time. So there is just a, a poetic overview and the princes of Issachar and so forth. And uh, it just gives us then um, a, a portrait of how God then defeated him. And so mentioning K a jail here and um, she reached and she did this. And, and so out of the window, she looks and beholds the mother of Sisera. It's kind of an interesting text here because it kind of imagines what the mother of this man who's just been killed is thinking. Why does his chariot delay in coming? Why do the hoofbeats of his chariots tarry? Terry, her wise princesses would answer her. She repeats words to herself. Are they not finding or not dividing the spoil? Very interesting how it kind of gives us a little bit of a hint as to um, their own, the, the uh, mindset of these, uh, of these um, people who are really enemies of Israel. But um, we see at this last verse, let all your enemies perish, O Lord. Let those who love him be like the rising of the sun in its might. And the land was undisturbed for 40 years. So once again, you have that, that process of the land being undisturbed, a period of silence for 40 years in that portion of the land until it would happen again and again. So in this context, then, we go to the sixth, the next cycle, the fourth cycle, in which Gideon becomes the judge. In this case, you're oppressed by Midian further south. So there's another area of Israel. But again, it says, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord is so repetitive. And they served the Midian seven years and the power of Midian prevailed. And because of that, um, it was then, uh, it, it describes how they would camp against them, destroy the produce of the land and, and they would uh, come up with their livestock and their tents and they would come in like locusts, devastating the land. So Israel it tells us was brought very low because of Midian and the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. So the process, though, they waited years before they would cry out to the Lord. And you get, again, you have to wonder why was there such a long delay between the, the problem and their response to it? There's a certain stubbornness that leads them further and further away from God and more and more toward autonomy. And it's only through their pain that they even think about God. And again, it reminds us of that whole idea that it's pain that often gets our attention far more than when things are going well for us. So when we are at the end of our resources, then often that's when we will be uh, come to the point where we have to turn to God. Has it come to this again, this, this mindset to think of prayer as a last refuge? It's an incredible concept. There's a distance. And in our own lives, we can see that there's also a, a strange str a struggle that we have. And in this struggle, we want our own autonomous end. We have certain desires for ourselves. And we pray and almost seeking to kind of get God to conform to our purposes, our plans, our, our patterns, our desires for our lives. And when that doesn't happen, we often then ind indirectly get angry with God, perhaps not directly, but we do. And we want to press on and push our own way and it only leads to growing problems and obstacles. Only when we finally repent, when we turn around, when we return to God, then do we find that there's a hope of restoration. But it is a stubbornness in our own lives when we refuse to uh, wait upon the Lord in this way. And so in this case here, we're going to be studying more of this in a couple of weeks, uh, the text about the, the Midianites and what takes place here. 
Um, it was, the Lord says, it was, I was the one who brought you up from Egypt. He has to remind them again, I delivered you and I'm the Lord your God. Don't fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you haven't obeyed me. So the angel of the Lord comes and sits um, and, uh, and meets with um, Gideon. And the angel of the Lord appears to him and said, the Lord's with you, O valiant warrior. And he says, are you talking to me? So my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has this happened? And the answer is obvious why it happened. The, the scriptures make it clear because of the rebellion against him. But now it says the Lord, he's so he's actually saying the Lord has abandoned us, a wrong point of view. No, actually, this is because they abandoned him. So the real question then is, um, how am I going to deliver Israel? He says, my family is the least. The Lord said, I will surely be with you. You will defeat Midian as one man. So Gideon said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, show me a sign. Gideon wanted his signs. We'll see that uh, as a motif in his life. Um, I'm going to bring out my offering, lay it before you, and, I'm, and I'll remain until you return. So he prepared a young goat, unleavened bread, brought them out. The angel of the Lord said, take the meat and the unleavened bread, lay them on the rock. And so the angel put the end of his staff that was in his hand, touched the meat and the unleavened bread. The fire sprang up from the rock, consumed it and the unleavened bread. And then the angel of the Lord vanished. When he saw it was the angel of the Lord, he says, alas, O Lord God, for now I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord then uh, spoke to him uh, and how he did this, well, it doesn't say it was the angel, but he, the Lord said, peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Gideon built an offer there to the Lord and named it, the Lord is peace. And so on the same night, the Lord said, now take your father's bull, a second bull, seven years old, pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, cut down the Asherah, which is uh, again, Canaanite deities, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this stronghold in an orderly manner. Take the second bull and offer a burnt offering. So he took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord commanded him. Of course, this was a great offense because the altar of Baal was destroyed. So they were angry with him. The, the Baal was torn down, the Asherah, and the second bull was offered. They said, who's done this thing? And so they searched about and found out that, that it was, in fact, a Gideon. And so they, brought, they wanted him to then be destroyed because of this. And again, Joash said to all, you're going to contend for Baal? You're going to deliver him? Who's going to plead for him and be, he'll be put to death by mourning? If he's a god, let him contend for himself because someone has torn down his altar. So really, uh, let Baal contend. And they named him Jerubal, Jerubbabel, uh, because you have the idea of uh, let Baal contend. So the, as they assembled themselves, and it was an enormous number, an enormous opposition, so the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet. And ultimately he called the other tribes to join him, messengers uh, to the, throughout the tribe of Manasseh and also Asher and Zebul Zebulun and Naphtali. And he had an authority and he, they came up to meet him. Um, we'll stop right there and just want to go back to one, one principle that I've been talking about here. And I mentioned this last time, but it's well worth uh, uh, noting this, that you have this, this process that seems to go on and on and on, so that you have the problem of sin, and they seem to stay there, and they serve as a result of that. They serve God. Uh, they, they serve, rather, um, the, 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 the one who brought about their bondage instead of serving the living God. So sin leads to bondage, to servitude. And finally, after enough time, years take place. And this is the amazing part. Years before they will respond in supplication because that's the stubbornness, the rebellion of the human heart. Only then uh, will God provide the salvation and that leads the salvation to silence or rest. But what you see here is this process where they kind of hang around here, serving years and years. And then after, then they go around and then right back to here. So they're building their house here rather than here. What's wrong with this picture? So essentially what you've got then is people who are serving serving sin. And when they finally cry upon uh, to the Lord, God delivers them, but then they go right back to their own way. So they build their house over here rather than over, over on this side over here. So instead of living where they could live and building their house in a context of rest and peace where they have now a place where they could live 
before God. And when they sin, then the, the way to deal with it, it would be this, live here. And then when we sin, for who doesn't turn against God, we deal with it quickly. You don't just hang and hover here. You go around and you stay here. So then your process is far different. You, you, you hang here and then go whoop, right back to here, rather than the other way around. And that to me is uh, a way of, of life and of redemption and of renewal when we choose to go the way of the living God rather than to go our own path of folly and, and foolishness. So to me, that is a, a mindset that we need to embrace, a perspective we need to in, in, in enjoy is to rest in the, the hand of the living God. I have to be honest with you, I find myself constantly pushing back and wanting things to go my way. Each day, in fact, I find that I have to recalibrate according to what's taking place. I have my desires, you do too. And at the same time though, you hold your plans with a loose enough grip before the living God, and you trust in him for the outcome. And you don't know what he's gonna bring this day, but already this day is different. Even now, it's different than perhaps what you had planned in many ways. So many circumstances that are completely out of our control that take place. Um, and when these things occur then, we want to immediately find out some kind of a why. We don't always get that why, but many times I think it's God reminding us of two important factors that we may tend to forget. Number one, we don't control anything. God's the one who's in control. And number two, God wants what's best for us, even though we suppose we have a better idea than, what, than God what our best interests look like. So when I wrestle with these things and wonder why does it happen? As for example, last Wednesday, uh, when I was with you, I was there in St. Simon's Island, and um, we on our drive to get there, um, around Stockbridge, um, I was on 75 and heading, uh, it wasn't very far from Atlanta, and uh, then um, there's some construction on the highway, and uh, the, the suddenly the left lane is full of d debris, and evidently something caught in my uh, my front passenger uh, tire, and it blew. So I had to go four lanes across to get out of the traffic as quickly as I could. And the net effect, instead of getting there at 4.30 in the afternoon, it ended up getting to St. Simon's Island at 9.30. Now, what's the purpose of that? And you may wonder about that. Was there any possible redemptive dynamic that can occur that makes sense out of that kind of a thing? It's because we always want to make it sensible to us. The best I could come up with that five hour delay was it's a test really for us to reveal our hearts, to reveal two things that you aren't in control, you may forget that, and also to give you a sense of gratitude and for you, instead of complaining and grumbling, to realize really you're privileged to even be in that car. You're privileged to have the freedom to drive and you determine, you don't determine your ways and your steps. God can teach us lessons even in these circumstances. And though we may not ever get an answer in this life as to why, there is a why that God himself knows. And I look back in that process, and really it was a process of re reflection for me as I'm seeking to s discern how then should I live? How do I respond in this? And that's a trivial thing compared to so many problems that we encounter. But it's, it's, it's a good basic illustration and this is why I say that we need to live more canonically. Kenosis, remember, means emptying. So you really let go of your own agenda of what uh, you have in your mind is what God's your best interest for you would be. And then you embrace his agenda instead. And you realize every time you do that, in, in retrospect, you realize his purposes are good. We may not fully see it in this life. There's so many mysteries we can't begin to grasp but we begin to discover that God's promises are good and that ultimately we trust in him in spite of circumstances to the contrary. And we cry out to him rather than spending our time in servitude to a rebellious, angry spirit, to unforgiveness, to bitterness, to anger, to wrath, to things that are unbecoming. And instead we set our minds on the things above. It's as, as the text, of course, uh, that comes to my mind is Philippians. When we think about Philippians chapter four, and particularly verses uh, six and following, where it tells us to be anxious for nothing, 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. In other words, don't wait and succumb to the, the sin of anxiety, of fear, of anger, of wrath, of unforgiveness, any number of things that can pull us down and cause us to live in that realm of servitude. But instead, make your supplication to him. That's what he says. In everything, by prayer and supplication. Then he says it, another word for prayer is thanksgiving. So he says, in everything, by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. And then a fourth word for prayer is requests. Make them known to God. And then it tells us that a supernatural thing will occur when you do this. That God's peace, and it surpasses all comprehension. It'll guard or garrison. It'll protect your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So then we have to make our, our decision. So when I'm hanging around in that, in that tire store, and there's nothing I can do about it, because after all, I realize that I can't, uh, I'd like to buy the tire and put it on, but I don't have a, 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 a machine to take it off the rim and put it on. So I'm stuck there and it, it added all that time. What should I do during that time? I've got an option. I can either fume and fuss and fret, or I can actually then return to God and say, let me use this time wisely. Let me consider his ways. Let me be grateful. Let me be dependent upon him and leave the outcome in his hands because I don't know what my best interests look like. Indeed, verse eight follows. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, um, or right, whatever is pure, lovely, good repute, excellence, worthy of praise, any of these things. And this is not where we typically turn to. We t often turn to what's not true and what's not honorable what's not right, what's, not, what's impure, what's ugly, and it's called the news. And if we focus on those things and the world itself, we're gonna lose our perspective. I'm not saying that we are to be ignorant of what's going on in the world, but at the same time, we need to inform our understanding of the world by our understanding of the word. And the word then becomes predominant. That's why I argue again and again, his word, the first word, his word, the last word in your day. So rather than bookending it with the news, really focus on what God's about because God's word then is going to be always relevant, always timeless because it comes from him. Again, I'm, I marvel how we can look at a text of this nature, something this uh, old, and yet it speaks even now eloquently to the human condition in so many ways that is quite remarkable. Let me open it up then to see what kind of comments or questions you might have. Hey Ken, this is uh, Bill Loveless. Yeah. Um, what intrigues me is the scene in verses 11 and 12, where you've got uh, this uh, Gideon, this coward in the, in the wine press, you know, beating the wheat and stuff like that. And then you had the angel of the Lord show up looking at him and looks down and says, hello, mighty man of valor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, are you talking, are you talking to me? And that's what you, that's the immediate question yeah. you raised, you know, <laughs> who are we talking to here? So isn't yeah. it interesting how God sees us in a way that we often don't see ourselves? Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's uh, that's right. I mean, that's what I get out of that is he sees himself as a coward, but God sees what he's going to become. And that's a good that's word. Very similar to us. Yeah, good word. Yes. So we look at a person no longer after the flesh, but according to uh, who that person now is in Christ is in Christ. So if we consider one text that comes to my mind from that uh, your comment there, uh, it, what made me what made me uh, what came to my mind is Second Corinthians. And it's chapter five, because it tells us about this very idea where it says um, the love of Christ can, therefore from now on, you see the text, we recognize no one according to the flesh, yet we know him uh, this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. And so what we're now seeing then is instead of looking at people according to the flesh, we're now called to look at them according to who they truly are as new beings. And this is a very different picture, isn't it? It's a very different orientation of how we can re view ourselves. Um, so we see each other. If we begin to see each other as God sees us, that's, that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Ken. Yes. 
when they go round and round in circles. I think there used to be a rock song about that or something. I think there was. Anyway, anyway, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, it's reminiscent of what happened to to the, when they got out of uh, Egypt. They just go round and round like for forty years in, in the desert, going in circles. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing, and a lot of the things parallel the same thing, like the complaints and stuff, like like the accusation. God moved away from them. God yes. didn't move. They yeah. moved away from God. Yes. You notice the complaint that was made that, uh, why is this happening? Why hasn't God re de delivered us? They're only looking at from their point of view as if we're innocent. And they failed to grasp that the, that the biblical narrative shows the problem and reveals the issue of their rebellion against his purposes. But they're complaining about God not really keeping covenant. They're the ones who abandoned covenant. So it, it always comes down to that, doesn't it? At the end, is this, is this constant uh, struggle that we have. Yeah. But it's, it's intriguing how... So my desire for all of us is that we would train ourselves and learn to really live in a certain way that uh, causes us to see uh, our true destiny and our true <clears throat> meaning and our true purpose. It comes down to this thing that I so often have shown you, this whole idea of who you really are. Grasp who you are and don't... But don't look at it as from the outstanding outside perspective. Look at what the word tells you you are. And then this tells you you are a person who is, in fact, um, before the living God. You have a purpose and a calling. You have a position and you want to practice that out. You want to live that out accordingly. So it's a, it's a point of view or a perspective we need to embrace. What other thoughts yeah. do you have? Yeah. Yeah. Uh a man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. You know, it may be totally different than what you plan. Yeah, that's yeah. Very often, that's the case, and we realize that. Yeah, there's this constant. I find myself every day. I've got to train myself to um, see things through God's word, through the lens of His word, rather than through the world itself that's trying to define me. So there's this. But every day we're going to be wrestling with this. What does my best interest look like? I have my plans. I'd like it to be this way. I pray about that, but I have to recognize the difference. Remember between hoping for and hoping into. I hope for certain things, but I can't. I must only hope in God. But so often, though, God has to uh, allow us to go into this this degradation until we finally come to the end of ourselves and then look up. And sometimes Amen. the only place we have is to look up. But wouldn't it be smart, though, to listen to him earlier, to wait, not, instead of waiting until pain is there, enjoy him in the pleasures of life. Enjoy him when things are going well. Be grateful and thankful for the good things in your life. And that contextualize. The more you are thankful, it's a, it's a discipline. The more we develop that skill of thanksgiving, I think the more we then we realize it reveals so many graces that we've formally taken for granted. How often do we thank God for our health, our well-being, our ability to see, our ability to walk, the freedoms that we have? We thank him for that, but it's almost, if we're not careful, perfunctory, what have we done for me lately becomes often the mindset. This is the day the Lord has made. Let yeah. us rejoice and be glad in him. We'd be glad in him. Yeah, exactly so. Yeah, so this is why I always begin the day with these and these four areas here of thanking God for these four areas, his, the, cre the, 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 the beauty of his created order. Uh, when I, then I think about uh, his material blessings that he's poured uh, lavished upon us in so many ways. Then the spirit, relational blessings we've received and then the spiritual. So if we are choose the way of gratitude, then we um, move throughout the course of the day with greater wisdom and prudence and discernment and understanding. And again, I encourage you to use these spiritual renewal cards for, this, for these reasons, especially because we forget these identity affirmations. We forget who we are. And, and Gideon didn't know who he was. God had to redefine Gideon. So it's an interesting point of view here. So Gideon has one Im impression of himself, almost like he's a loser. But God says, no, you actually are a mighty warrior before me, but you must walk in my strength and my energy and my power and my resources, or you will not be able to prevail. So it comes down to that. Here is who you are, now live it. And this is why I, I, I speak about, here is who you are. Who are you? You're a child of God. 
If this is true, then how do you live that out? What does that look like? So who, what, who gets to determine who you are, the world or the word? What other thoughts? You know, Ken, yeah. uh -huh. with all the circles that you were drawing, it reminds me of uh, the picture for the Braves. It kept on going around the perimeter. You know, instead of asking for help, you know, circles, you know, instead of really surrendering and doing that, he still tried to figure out himself and then missed pitching in the game. Uh, the game that uh, was, was the important thing. Yeah. What's your calling in this world? Because you can't be all things to all people, but you have to be the person, God's man for this time, for this hour, for this place. Why were you and I called into being? What is God's purpose for our life? And unless we really immerse ourselves in the truth of the word, unless we have a community of people where we mutually re, uh, uh, encourage and, and uh, empower, um, enhancing each other's lives, we can lose ourselves very quickly, get all wrapped up into false gods again. And so it may not be the, the gods of the Amorites and the Canaanites, but it'd be the gods of this world and the, the things that people bow down to and exchange their lives for. So we have to decide who is really the Lord, who is the Lord of our lives. And sometimes they will root things out in painful ways to get our attention and to force us to realize that only there can I thrive and survive.